Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I know that I'm coming between you and dessert, and I know I'll lose that, so let me just say right now, eat. Uh, it's absolutely fine with me. Thank you, Chancellor Peacock, uh, Deans Witt and Edwards for your kind, warm welcomes and, and this wonderful event. Thank you, Richard, for that great introduction. Um, before I start, I want to just also thank uh, Brad Wilson for those great, moving uh, remarks earlier. Uh, we do value our partnership with you. I know we don't always get along on some small issues, uh, but in general, we do value the partnership, the collaboration, and the innovation. One specific innovation that I do want to rec uh, reference is our Quality Center. About a decade ago, we got together and decided that the one thing that we could all commit to doing was making sure that we're providing the highest quality, safest patient care in North Carolina through a very generous grant. We got that center started. We're really making a difference. So not only do you talk the talk, but you walk the walk, and we're grateful. Um, I like to start by telling you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, and uh, I, I still reserve the right to change it because I'm not done yet. Um, but we're on a journey. Healthcare is on a journey. And what I wanted to make sure that I was able to articulate today is the hospital perspective. Now, I don't work at any individual hospital. I'm a vote counter. Um, I work at the legislature and I work in Congress. And my job is to be able to make sure that the very good people like Representative Jordan, Representative Hastings, and their colleagues have an understanding of what it all means, what their decisions mean, uh, and how they can enact the types of public policies that make sure that the vision that we just heard actually can come to fruition. Now, I don't know where that journey is going to take us, and I don't think anybody really does, and that's part of the challenge that we've got. We do know that healthcare costs too much. We do know that we've got to get better value out of it, and we all know that we've got to figure out how to get there. From the hospital perspective, we're in parallel worlds, right? So we talked about the volume-based system. We talked about the value-based system. Well, we're moving towards value. We know that we have to. We're committed to it. But we got to keep the doors open. We got to keep providing the patient care so that when, you know, your daughter has a broken leg, she knows where to come, or your mother has a stroke, she knows where to come. And we're there, and we're providing that care in partnership with the great doctors, nurses, and the, the healthcare professionals who do that all day, every day. We've got to work in both worlds, and that's part of the challenge that we face. At the same time, we've got to help people really to understand personal responsibility for their health care. Because at the end of the day, we can do miracles, and we do miracles every day, and we work with our people to pay for it to get it financed. But if people aren't doing the things that you talked about in terms of prevention and, and personal responsibility, we've got to develop systems that enable that. But ultimately, we've got to help people to live the healthy lives because the best and most effective health care is health care that's avoided. So we've got to make sure that's part of what we do. And if you take away nothing else from what I tell you today, remember this, uncertainty. Uncertainty is what's really driving the hospital's lives, the doctor's lives, and everybody which, with whom you uh, interface on a regular basis. Government has a profound role in what we do. You know what's happening in government. It's dysfunctional, that's the word I keep hearing. Uh, it pays for a lot of what we do. We have to operate in that environment. And the healthcare marketplaces that you've read about, not working very well. All those things are out there. We're trying to figure it out. So if you're a hospital and you say, oh, we want to build a better system, what does that really look like, right? Well, we don't have a healthcare system. We have at least three healthcare systems in the United States. Government, from the hospital perspective, Medicare and Medicaid pays for about two-thirds of the patients that we treat. Medicare has its rules. Medicaid has its rules. We have to figure out what all that looks like, one system. Nine percent of the patients that we treat don't have insurance. So imagine you're running your business, nine percent of your patients, they walk through the door, you know you're never going to get paid. So we've got to figure out what the rules are for that system how we develop the types of systems that keep them out of the hospital, keep them healthy so they never come back. So we've got that rule. And then we've got 25% that actually have commercial insurance. Business generally pays for most of that. We're grateful, thank you. Um, but Blue Cross is the dominant insurer, but there are all kinds of other insurance companies with whom we interact on a regular basis. They all have different utilization management protocols. They all have different enrollment contracts. They all have different rules by which we operate. The point is, if you're going to develop a system, you've got to figure out which one of those is right. And I'm not saying we want a government system or a commercial system or whatever. Currently, we got three systems. We have to figure out how to operate in all of those. I will make one quick observation that I looked this morning. 14% of healthcare spending 
in America is on administration. 14%, the number that I found, $90 billion. So we need to figure out how we do that better as part of our conversations. So before I leave that conversation, I also want to tell you that unfortunately, those of you who have private insurance pay more because government doesn't pay what it ought to pay for the care that we're providing. Patient shows up, we provide the care, we send a bill to government, they send us back less than what it costs us to care for those patients. We've estimated that if everybody had insurance and it paid what it costs us, your amount that you pay would be 30% less. So one of the things we got to figure out is how do we deal with that problem? Because as Brad and his colleagues, Mr. Wilson, I don't know what I'm supposed to call you, Brad, um, is out there negotiating rates with all of us, he's trying to ratchet down as much as he can. And we're saying, well, wait a minute, government didn't pay us what it costs. We've got to figure out how to keep the doors open as we do this volume-based system and move to a value-based system. We also look at a system, you got to look at who provides the care. And right now, generally, we're a series of cottage industries. You've got hospitals, you've got doctors, you've got pharmacies, you've got home care agencies, you've got nursing homes. All of them do great work for the patient when the patient is under their care. But what we're talking about is building a system where we're all aligned. We're all working for the long-term interest of that patient, not just how do we do the best that we know how to do for that patient right now, which is what we're all committed to doing. Every person that touches that patient is committed to doing what they believe is absolutely in that patient's best interest at that time. The problem is we don't know how that works over time. And if we're really going to build a system, we've got to talk about how we do that better. I'm not saying that's not occurring because it is all over the place, but that's part of what we have to look at. So who determines that, right? Who, who, who sets up these rules that's going to build this volume-based system? Well, we know the overall mantra. We've got to pay for value, not volume. We've got to pay for outcomes, not inputs. Ultimately, we've got to build a system that keeps people healthy. It doesn't just pay for care when people get sick. But who says how that's going to work? Well, we would like to have a say in that. We're working very hard in partnership with insurers and government and everybody else to do that. Our, our motto is the triple aim. It's better care, improving the quality, lower cost, we know we've got to take costs out, and better health. If you talk to any of the hospital executives here, they'll tell you that's what they're working on in one shape or another. We've got to have better data to do that because we've got to know where the patients are so that we can follow up with them. And a lot of the transparency stuff that we talked about will flow from that. And ultimately, we have to support individual behaviors. We got to align all those systems and help keep the patient healthy. I won't go into all the things that, that Brad talked about in terms of the federal government and ACOs and bundled payments and all those, but they've got their view of what that ought to look like. They're continuing their fee-for-service system just like um, the insurers are. In the state of North Carolina, we've got a great program called the Community Care in North Carolina program. And it's kind of a leading example of how we can work together. It's doctors, hospitals, health departments, social service agencies reaching out, trying to provide better care to Medicaid patients. Because we've all learned that if you keep a Medicaid patient out of the hospital, you keep them from going to the ED, you, keep, you manage their chronic diseases, not only is it better care, but it saves money. Well, we know that Medicaid is broken. It's costing too much. Uh, and there's going to be a whole lot of conversation about how to fix it. Um, and one of the things that we're struggling with is how do we build on what we know is working and make it work better without blowing it up and bringing in something that will probably make it worse. Again, I point that out only because they're going to have an opinion as well about what this new system looks like. So again, we've got three systems we're trying to figure out how we make them all work together. And we're going to partner with the people that actually pay the bills. Uh, our employer-sponsored insurance companies, Blue Cross Blue Shield and others, to figure out how to make those systems work. So everybody wants to have a say in what the future looks like, and they should. Bottom line is we're operating under parallel paths. We want to get to that value-based system. We want it desperately. We've got to keep the doors open. And that's now where I turn to the Affordable Care Act, which is what I was asked to talk about. Well, I'm not going to say it's a good idea or a bad idea. That's everybody's individual decision. It's a political decision. It's a value-based decision. For my purposes today, as you said, it's the law of the land. But from our perspective, it's a law that is in severe challenge, whether good or bad, which creates a huge amount of uncertainty. And so we have to operate under those principles. So from our perspective, when the law was getting enacted, 
The idea was, let's get the people that don't have health insurance coverage covered. From a hospital or a healthcare provider, that is a great thing, right? Because what it does, it does two things. Well, it does many things, but one of them is it says, you can have health insurance so you don't have to come to the hospital emergency department. You can go see a doctor. You can get care in a more comprehensive, less costly place. From our perspective, that's a good thing. Believe it or not, we're one of the only healthcare providers that's trying to decrease volume of inappropriate care. We don't want people coming there that don't need to be there because we're busy enough with people who do need to be there. So getting people health insurance is a good thing. Um, we'd also like to get paid, frankly, when somebody does show up. 9% of our patients don't have any insurance, and um, that would be helpful to us. And fundamentally, it also lays a broader foundation uh, for that better system of care. So how would that happen under the Affordable Care Act? Well, you got to pay for the subsidies, right? You got to pay for that insurance. The exchanges, employers, individuals, others would be fined, right, taxed. The Supreme Court said it's a tax um, to pay for that, to provide the dollars. Um, but there also would be significant cuts to hospital payments under the bill. And the theory was we would take a, a cut under the Medicare program because the people that would show up would have insurance, right? So the financing of it really is fees, penalties, taxes, and provider payment cuts largely through hospital cuts. How would you achieve the expanded coverage? Well, exchanges, right? We decided in North Carolina we didn't want to have a state exchange, neither a good decision or a bad decision, just a fact. We would rely on the federal exchange. Well, how'd that work out, right? I'll leave that to your, but so we would have exchanges. We also would get expanded coverage through Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid is the partnership. Well, really, it's not much of a partnership between the federal government and the state. It really is the federal government setting the rules, telling you what you got to do, and then asking the state to provide a third of the dollars. But it's a partnership, not the kind of partnership we hope to have. Um, but Medicaid would be expanded to provide care to the low, lowest income people, really the people between up to 138% of the federal poverty level. So that was the theory, right? Provider cuts, taxes, expanded insurance through subsidized premiums on the exchange and Medicaid expansion. Well, what's happened in North Carolina is that the cuts have come. So not only do we have the almost $780 million worth of federal cuts through uh, Obamacare, we also have the sequester that's coming down so that Medicare really significantly underpays us now for the care that we provide. State decided not to expand Medicaid, hopefully yet, um, because Medicaid does need a lot of work. And I think that those of you who are working on the budget recognize that it is stopping employees from getting pay raises. It is stopping the types of investments that we need to make in our great educational institutions. And we get the fact that we have got to get our arms around the Medicaid program. But from our perspective, these are patients that are showing up. And the state has decided not to draw down federal dollars that would help us provide the care and reduce the amount we have to ask Brad and his colleagues to pay for through the cost shifting. Um, business and individuals are having to ask themselves very, very difficult questions. What am I gonna do? I've got this new cost, can I afford it? Should I just wait until I get sick and then sign up? We were having that conversation at lunch. And if you're a business, where's that line between investing in your employees and providing an employee benefit so you can recruit and retain the best and the brightest? with a real bottom line decision about how much is this gonna cost me to provide that care? Y'all are all struggling with those decisions. From our perspective, what that means is the 25% of y'all that actually pay your bills and help us keep the doors open, that's in flux, that's uncertain. We know government's cutting us, we're counting on y'all, and y'all are making rational business decisions that will affect all the things that we do all day, every day. So the Affordable Care Act for us is providing a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Now, again, we get the fact we got to change. We get the fact we got to take costs out. So what are we doing? Well, 90% of the hospitals in North Carolina are public or nonprofit, 90%. So what does that mean? Well, that means we have to have a margin, no margin, no mission, right? But if we do have a margin, we reinvest it in goods and services and, and employees back in our community. But we got to cut costs. We don't have a choice. So our hospitals are doing lean management. They're looking all over to try to figure out how to do what they do better. Because we don't have a choice. It's the right thing to do. We have to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and of your dollars. We're also laying off a lot of people. You may have read in the papers, 
So far, we estimate about 2,000 layoffs have occurred in North Carolina's hospitals. We expect by the time all these cuts flow through to have about 10,000 jobs eliminated in hospitals in North Carolina over the next year. Again, we have to take costs out. Unfortunately, we're going to ask you to pay more. Um, we don't have a choice. We will cut and cut and cut to the best that we can. We will never sacrifice quality. You made that very clear in your investment in us. We will never sacrifice quality, but we're going to have to figure out how we do all that. So the bottom line from my perspective is that great Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times. We live in very interesting times. Uh, from the hospital perspective, as these government cuts continue to roll through, you're going to see job losses. You're going to see consolidation. Doctors are trying to figure out, can I even stay doing this? They don't want to invest in the IT systems. They don't want to invest in the management. They don't want to do all They want to practice medicine. They want to care for patients. They want us to manage it. So they're coming to us to do that. Smaller systems, smaller hospitals are ask, having to ask themselves, can I go at it alone? So they'll partner with larger systems to get efficiencies, to be able to purchase goods more cost effectively. Why do banks merge so they can consolidate, so they can be more efficient? That's why hospitals are doing it too. We don't have a choice. We got to make sure we're still responsive to our communities, but you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, we're going to continue to focus on quality. Every time I have a board meeting, every time we talk about this, my members say we will never sacrifice quality. We will cut a service before we do anything that's going to impair the quality of care that we deliver to our community. We're also going to keep working towards the triple aim. We know it's the right thing to do. We will have to uh, d develop those incentives, and we have to get to where we need to get. Please take this away. Working together, as we talked about earlier, we can and we will and we must build this better system. We don't have a choice. Your community hospitals, as I said, are nonprofit and public organizations. We have to have a margin to stay into business. We are going to do the best job we can to be good stewards of your dollars and your resources. We're going to have to use the data that's available to make sure that we're doing that. We're going to ask you all to hold us accountable, too. Right? We're going to ask you all to look at those data, come work with us and try to figure out how can we do it better, because you're going to have more chances to do that. We're going to work with you on personal accountability. We talked uh, across the way about health care powers of attorney, um, end of life types of decision making. Make sure you have those. Talk to your family members. We've got to engage, if not as a society, individually, one by one by one, to ask ourselves those difficult questions because the best and most cost effective health care is what? Health care you don't consume because you're taking care of yourself. Together we can do that. Please let us know what we can do to help you. We are grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to deliver these remarks and deliver what the Affordable Care Act means to your community's hospitals. And thank you very much for this very exciting event.